Where is the evening item 21153? Where are the classes? Welcome back, everybody, to another Transformers Theory. Today's is going to be covering all of Barricade's disappearances in the Bayverse, along with how he got his new body in The Last Night, and so much more. So without further ado, let's jump right in. Now, Barricade's timeline in the five Bay films is very messy. In the first film, he disappears on the freeway right before the final battle. In Revenge of the Fallen, he doesn't appear whatsoever, but he later appears in Dark of the Moon, and is later assumed to be killed by Nest. Though his death seemed plausible since he didn't appear in Age of Extinction, he would later show up in The Last Night, appearing to be better than ever, with him sporting an entirely different body with no explanation whatsoever, but yet again in his barricade fashion would disappear right before the final battle. So to repair this mess of a timeline, I am going to be creating my own for the bad cop. But I won't be covering the comics in this video since the majority of the content in them are no longer canon, due to Age of Extinction and The Last Night screwing up their timeline. But I will be using significant dates from them and plausible events that I feel would logically line up within the Bayverse. So with that said, let's begin. Our timeline begins on December 25th, 2003. It's been some time since Cybertron has fallen. A unit of Decepticons under Starscream's command consisting up of Barricade Brawl and Bone Crusher have been going planet to planet searching for clues to the Allspark and Megatron's whereabouts. They were about to leave Mars until spotting a strange object landing on the Red Planet. This strange object would be the Beagle 2 rover, but it wouldn't stay in one piece for long since after observing it for a bit, Starscream would destroy it. The Decepticons would discuss how this discovery was evidence of intelligent life being present in their current solar system, and would then travel to the next planet in line, in the hopes of finding their master and the cube. Now, you may be wondering what evidence I have to prove the events that I just listed. Well, let's start off with the Beagle 2 rover. The 07 film tells us that the Beagle 2 rover successfully deployed on Mars, operating for a few short moments, transmitting live images of the Martian surface to Earth. Then, without warning, a massive robot appeared on its camera, and all transmissions ceased. We also know that Sector 7 would cover up this event by creating false reports deeming the mission a failure. The date, December 25th, 2003, was when the Beagle 2 rover landed on Mars in real life. The first ever teaser trailer for Transformers uses the same year in it, hence why I started off the timeline on this date. We also know that the Decepticons were searching for the Cube and Megatron during this time, since in the 07 film they are still searching for them, proven by the many events that happened in that film, such as the two hacks the cons attempted when trying to get information on Project Iceman. Now, you may be wondering why I did not include Blackout and Scorponok in Starscream's search party. That's because they made Planetfall in March 2007. Now, the 07 film takes place in June 2007. We know it's the month of June since Sam just finished up his junior year of high school, and the movie taking place during its release year is backed up by George Bush being president. In the 07 film, Harrison tells Colonel Sharp that the helicopter that was approaching their airbase had a registry number of 4500X on its vertical stabilizer. And, as we know, that helicopter was shot down three months earlier in Afghanistan. Sir, this here 4500X was shot down three months ago, Afghanistan. It's gotta be a mistake. Check again, then recheck. I did, sir. A friend of mine was on that chopper. So, if you subtract three months off of June 2007, you get March 2007, which is when Blackout shot down 4500X. Now, granted, it's entirely possible that Blackout was part of the search party led by Starscream, and later on decided to change alternate mode, seeing 4500X as his opportunity, but personally, Blackout does not come off as the type to change alternate modes, unlike a famous yellow Camaro. Hence why I believe he landed in Afghanistan in March 2007, and upon seeing 4500X, he shot it down, taking the form as his own. As for when Scorponok landed, we know that he came to Earth with Blackout since he is his Minicon. This is further backed up since he transforms into one of Blackout's T-64 turboshaft engines. And if you don't believe me, take a look at this clip from the Special Features DVD of Transformers 2007. Like, I, I wanted to have 
the, the, the notion of these components from the Sea Stallion helicopter, which is basically what he is birthed from. So he has these kind of Sea Stallion helicopter components to him, and the turbines for his hands, and I wanted to see how these things could turn, and how that he could dig in, and then shoot the sand out the exhaust, and all those things that we developed. So with that evidence in place, let's continue. Eventually, the Decepticons made Planetfall landing in the state of Oklahoma. It seems like all of them besides Barricade landed in or near a military base, since they all have military alternate modes, which would mean that Barricade must have landed farther out and scanned his police car alternate mode. But there's a glaring issue with this, and that's Barricade's alternate mode. You see, his vehicle mode in Transformers 2007 is a 2006 Saline S281 Mustang. By placing Barricade's arrival on Earth in December 2003, it contradicts the very existence of his alternate mode, since it is a 2006 model car. But according to TF Wiki, the Mustang design that would eventually be the 2006 model debuted sometime in 2003, with police car modifications showing up in car shows not long after which would mean that Barricade could have easily scanned his Saline alternate mode by landing near a car show display. This would also explain why his police deco has no state or city markings on it, since due to it being a concept car, it wasn't legally required to have those markings on it. Now, one last thing that I would like to explain before I continue the timeline is why I believe the Decepticons landed in Oklahoma. And the biggest evidence that points towards this is Barricade's license plate and mustache man. In the 07 film, Barricade has an Oklahoma license plate, and that plate came from the car he scanned. On top of that, Barricade's mustache man has an Oklahoma Highway Patrol uniform. So those details alone confirm that Barricade landed in Oklahoma. Though we don't know if the other cons landed in the same state, I think it would be likely since the Autobots landed as a group when they came to Earth. So I don't see why the Decepticons wouldn't as well. Now the events that would happen from here would really come down to the cons searching the globe for Megatron and the Cube. Soundwave likely helped out during this time, possibly supplying the virus that Blackout and Frenzy would use to hack into the military database, which would eventually shut down global communications. Now, Soundwave had been on Earth since the 1970s, trying to hide the Ark's presence on the moon by acquiring human contacts in the United States and Soviet Union, whose creative accounting would render future trips to the moon financially unfeasible. So, it's definitely possible that Soundwave helped out in the hunt for Megatron and the Cube. I think that he sent out Frenzy to help out in the hunt, with him joining up with Barricade to give him assistance and the two of them would become close partners as the years passed. Now eventually, the events of the 2007 film take place, and this is where we get to Barricade's first disappearance. The last shot that we see of him was behind Bone Crusher, and after that he wouldn't be seen again up until Dark of the Moon. So then, what happened to him? Well, a few seconds earlier, Barricade attempts to cut traffic in the hopes of stealing the cube from Bumblebee. But Sam calls this out and tells the Autobots to block him. This causes Optimus Prime, Ironhide, and Ratchet to realign themselves just in time so they could prevent Barricade from getting closer to the Allspark. Now, the reason why this scene is important is because it draws the audience's attention to Barricade. But then right after this attention grabber, Bone Crusher causes a ruckus which subconsciously puts Barricade in the back of our minds. Since now Bone Crusher is in the forefront, and this is the perfect setup to make the audience expect a character to reappear. Since Barricade is still in the back of our minds, but yet in the film he doesn't reappear. Which begs the question on why this setup was used if there wasn't a payoff. Well, what if I told you that originally there was a payoff for Barricade in the 07 film? And that would be for him to attack and get killed by Prime. Now, this scenario plays out in Transformers the novel, written by Alan Dean Foster. The novel used an early version of the script to play out its story, and a scene of Barricade attacking Prime would happen right after Bone Crusher was killed. But Optimus would get the upper hand and throw him into a bridge column, which would decapitate Barricade. Now, this novel came out over a month before the 2007 film came out in theaters, and had a lot of other changes in it, such as Megatron eating Jazz's spark, and the Allspark being named the Energon Cube. Now, this isn't the only Transformers media that included this death scene for Barricade. IDW's Transformers movie adaptation issue number 4 has this death scene illustrated, 
with the comic being released 10 days before the 07 film came out. TF Wiki also states that several other Transformers adaptation media used this death scene as well. Now, interestingly enough, in the film after Prime kills Bone Crusher, he looks around to see if there were any more Decepticons in the area. This scene shows that Prime anticipated more Decepticons. And this barricade scene would work perfectly here. And to this day, it's unknown why Barricade's death scene was cut. But on a side note, do you think it's odd that Optimus was late to the final battle? From this scene here, it takes Optimus 8 minutes and 24 seconds to get to the city, while it took the Autobots from this scene 2 minutes and 4 seconds to get to the city. Now granted, it could have taken longer or shorter story-wise, but for the sake of simplicity, I'm using the film's runtime. But the point I'm trying to make is that something else must have distracted Optimus to cause him to be that late. And with what we know so far, there's only one candidate that comes to mind. The only issue with this is that in the original script, Barricade died. But we know for a fact that he survived since he appears in Dark of the Moon. So then, how could this fight possibly gone down? Well, I believe that Barricade would get the drop on Prime by jumping down from the overpass above, landing on the Autobot leader, causing Prime to fall on the ground. As Prime tried to get back up, Barricade would smack him with his mace, causing his opponent to stumble back. Barricade would use this to his advantage by jumping in the air and swinging his mace down towards Prime. But Optimus would get the upper hand by dodging the attack and countering with an uppercut. This would cause Barricade to fall on the ground. But the bad cop wasn't throwing in the towel just yet, since he attempted another swing towards Prime. But this attempt would be futile since Prime would grab the mace and use its momentum to swing Barricade into a bridge column. The impact would knock out Barricade, seeing that his opponent was down for the count. Along with knowing that his Autobots needed him, Prime would transform and make his way to LA. Now, you may be wondering why Prime decided to spare Barricade but not Bone Crusher. And, well, if you think about it, the reason why he put down Bone Crusher was because Bone actively went out of his way to kill innocent people by ramming and flipping over their cars. On top of that, Barricade was knocked out, so he wouldn't be going to the final battle anytime soon. And knowing that he was desperately needed elsewhere, Prime considered the job done and would travel to LA. Now, you could say that this is out of character for Prime since in the sequels he kills whenever he gets the chance. But if you remember in the first movie, Prime wasn't a psycho and only killed when it was necessary. So I think him sparing Barricade works since that action falls into how he acted in the 07 film. Now another thing that I would like to cover is Barricade being knocked out. And this isn't the first time he was KO'd since when he fought Bumblebee, he ultimately lost, causing him to be immobilized for some time after the fight. And since Optimus is way stronger than Bumblebee, that slam into the column would definitely cause Barricade to be knocked out leading for him to not participate in the final battle. Overall, I think that this fight between Prime and Barricade happened since this scene fills a lot of holes, such as why Prime was late to the final battle, and why Barricade was absent for the rest of the film. So with that said, let's move on to what happened to Barricade after the final battle. And well, we know that Starscream takes command of the Decepticons due to his line in Revenge of the Fallen, you left me to die on that pathetic insect plant. Only to help spawn our new army. The fallen decrees it. After all, in your absence, someone had to take command. We also know that he flies up into space and regroups with the Fallen to help him rebuild the Decepticon faction. But I think before he flew up into the Final Frontier, he regrouped with Barricade, where he would find the cop worse for wear, and would fill him in on the outcome of the final battle along with lecturing him on how he was now in charge. He would lastly inform him of his plan to travel to the Fallen in the hopes of rebuilding the Decepticon army, and would order Barricade to lay low for now. He would then transform and leave Earth while sending one last message. Now, though we don't know what this message meant, 
It could have been a transmission to Soundwave, who would logically be the only other Decepticon on Earth besides Barricade at this point. Likely containing the same thing Starscream told to Barricade. Now here is where we get into the events between Transformers 1 and Revenge of the Fallen. Now granted, there is limited information on what happened, so this is going to be pure speculation. One thing we do know for a fact is that during this time, many Decepticons came to Earth. Likely due to Soundwave sending a message into space. I think there's a good chance that Barricade provided the arriving cons with intelligence on the Autobots that they were facing, along with the Autobots' Human Alliance nest. I also believe that Barricade informed the Decepticons about Sam Witch Wiki, and I actually have evidence for this one, since Rampage actually refers to Sam by name. Now, the only living Decepticon at this time that knows about Sam would be Barricade. Now, granted, he did designate him by his eBay username, but the reason why we know that Barricade knows Sam's full name is because when Frenzy went to Sam's eBay page, his name was present in his bio and store name. So logically, he is the only Decepticon who could supply that information. Hence why Rampage knows Sam's name, which leads me to believe that Barricade supplied information to the new arrivals. But now, let's move on to the events of Transformers Revenge of the Fallen, which takes place in September 2009. We know the film takes place in 09 since Barack Obama is president. And we know it's the month of September since classes at Princeton University typically begin during the first or second week of September. Now, as we know, Barricade didn't show up in this film. But we do know at one point that he was planned to be in the film since he appears in an official skill chart that the animators used along with there being one short animatic of Bumblebee fighting Barricade in the Revenge of the Fallen Special Features DVD. Interestingly enough, three days after the 07 film premiered, writer Robert Orkey was asked about Barricade's disappearance from the film. In a message board Q&A session, he stated that it was a thread for movie two. But as we know, Barricade did not appear. Another Orkey Q&A would be held by TFW 2005 sometime after Revenge of the Fallen came out with Orky stating that he honestly couldn't remember why Barricade wasn't present. So then, what happened to Barricade? Well, the most logical answer would be that he was doing something else during the events of Revenge of the Fallen. But what would be more important than getting operational control of the Star Harvester, you may ask? Well, that would be Megatron's Plan C. In the original trilogy, Megatron had three distinct plans. Plan A was to secure the AllSpark and use it to restore Cybertron, but that failed since Sam used it to kill Megs. Plan B was to get operational control of the Star Harvester and use it to create enough Energon to restore Cybertron, but that plan failed when it was blown up by Prime. Plan C, on the other hand, was a whole different ballgame, and had been in the making for a while. That plan being Project Sentinel. You see, as the conflict on Cybertron dragged on with no end in sight, the leader of the Autobots, Sentinel Prime, found himself forced to make a drastic choice, a secret alliance with Megatron, believing that it was only through the sacrifice of another world that Cybertron could be restored. Sentinel developed teleportational space bridge technology to transport resources across interstellar distances, but knowing that Optimus would never condone his course of action, Sentinel kept his plans a secret claiming that the bridge was a means of transporting troops into battle. Sentinel's intention was to depart for the chosen planet Earth and meet Megatron there later, but during the battle that erupted around the departure of Sentinel's ship, the Ark, the vessel was damaged and sent spiraling off into the depths of space. Eventually, in 1961, the Ark crashed on the moon. The impact was detected by NASA, triggering the space race of the 1960s, leading to the United States of America's first trip to the moon in 1969, which was secretly an attempt to inspect the crashed alien ship. However, before Apollo 11 ever got there, a team of Decepticons led by Soundwave who had tracked the vessel removed the majority of the space bridge pillars from the ship to keep them out of human hands. The NASA astronauts found no trace of them, nor of Sentinel who was safely sealed away in the ship's crash vault with five remaining pillars. Ever since then, Soundwave had been hiding the Ark's presence on the moon, thanks to the help of his human collaborators in the US and Russia whose creative accounting would render future trips to the moon financially unfeasible. Now, at the end of Revenge of the Fallen, Megatron does say something interesting before departing. This is 
Now, granted, you can interpret this as the classic bad guy thing to say, but I think it has a deeper meaning. That being Megatron referring to Project Sentinel. But now how does this all tie back to Barricade missing in Revenge of the Fallen? Well, if you think about it, Soundwave has been keeping tabs on his human collaborators with the help of Laserbeak, by recruiting new collaborators and tying up loose ends. But sometime before the events of Revenge of the Fallen, Soundwave had been stuck up in space planning Megatron's resurrection, by trying to pinpoint where Megatron's body was laid to rest, along with trying to locate the Shard. And during the events of Revenge of the Fallen, he does all these things, along with coordinating a revival team to resurrect Megs, sending more Decepticons to Earth, and conducting a worldwide hack that broadcasted the Fallen's message to the world. Overall, Soundwave was very busy during the events leading up to and during Revenge of the Fallen. So I believe that he recruited Barricade to help keep tabs on the human collaborators while he orchestrated Megatron's revival. I also think that he recruited Loader since we do see him work with the human collaborators, but that's for another video. Now, you could say that there was no need for Barricade since Laserbeak and Loader already had it covered. Well, to that I say Soundwave had a massive amount of human collaborators, four of which we see in Dark of the Moon. Those being Jerry Wang, Bob Singer, Alexei Voskud, and Dylan Gold. And this doesn't include the murdered collaborators that we see in the flashback. And we know that many human collaborators existed throughout the US and Russia, though we don't know to what extent. I think it would be fair to say that there were many that helped out the cons. And it would be a no-brainer for Soundwave to recruit Barricade, since he would need as many overseers as he could get. On top of that, Barricade was qualified for the job, since he excels at getting information on people along with hunting them down and interrogating them. So with that said, I believe the reason why Barricade was absent during the events of Revenge of the Fallen was because he was helping out Soundwave keep tabs on the many human collaborators present in the United States of America, along with tying up any loose ends with those collaborators if necessary. Now, as for the events between Revenge of the Fallen and Dark of the Moon, I think Barricade continued keeping tabs on the human collaborators, since after their terrible defeat in Egypt, Megatron pulled ahead with Project Sentinel, which takes us to our next date in the timeline, that being September 2013. We know that Dark of the Moon takes place in 2013 since Sam just finished up his four-year degree in geopolitics, with him graduating from Princeton during the last week of May. We also know that Sam has been job hunting for three months due to a line Ron with Wiki says. Why did we bother sending him to an Ivy College for? He's three months out of school and he can't find a job? So with that said, Dark of the Moon logically takes place around September 2013. Now, in this film, Barricade is assumed to be killed by Nest, since both of his back eyes were shot out and his foot was blasted off. And the last time we would see him is when his body went limp. But yet he reappears in The Last Night Alive and Well, so how is this possible? Well, Dark of the Moon was planned to be the last film in the franchise. And this last scene of Barricade was supposed to be his official death. But when Dark of the Moon made over a billion dollars, sequels were inevitable. The real reason why Barricade appeared in The Last Night was because the producers went on some fan forums and saw how everybody wanted Barricade back. I read some of the fan blogs, and uh, there was a blog that had everybody vote on who's the character you'd love to see come back. And it was Barricade. And I went to Michael and I said, uh, Michael, we've got to bring Barricade back. We went and got the appropriate car and the appropriate vehicle and made Barricade for the fans for this one. So in a way, the fans retconned Barricade's death, which I find very fascinating. So since we know that Barricade is back, we have to figure out how he survived the events of Dark of the Moon. And there's one thing in his retconned death scene that is the key to answering this, that being when Barricade goes limp. You see, Barricade knew that there was no way out of that battle, with him already missing two eyes and a foot. He knew if he kept on putting up a fight, Nest would kill him. So to secure a chance at survival, he played dead. And luckily for Barricade, the Nest soldiers would eventually relocate to push on Shockwave when he tried to flee the area, leaving the location of where Barricade was at clear of danger. Now this begs the question on how Barricade escaped Chicago. Now, though Transformers can transform with missing parts, evident by Dark of the Moon Megatron with him missing part of his face, I don't think it's possible for a Transformer to transform with a missing limb. But on the other hand, they can take limbs from other Cybertronians and use them to replace their own. A key example was Dark of the Moon Megatron, 
After he got his arm chopped off in Revenge of the Fallen, he eventually was patched up by Scapel using a severed arm from a protoform that died in Operation Firestorm. Even though his new arm looks completely different from his original, it's still compatible with his body and he's still able to transform with it. Another example would be Squeaks from The Last Knight. After he got his arm shot off, it was later replaced by a spare Decepticon arm thanks to the help of Izzy. And this arm is from a completely different body, but yet it's still compatible for Squeaks to use. Now, the reason why I am bringing up this concept is because Barricade used it to escape Chicago. Though we don't know the extent of the damage done to Barricade's foot, it's safe to say that it was fully blown off since we see the damage extending up to his right knee, meaning that he would need a new right foot and some spare parts to reconstruct his knee. And Barricade would be in luck since if you remember, one protoform got their right leg shot off at the kneecap. And this leg would be the perfect size for Barricade since the protoform is around the same height as him. Now granted in this shot, the protoform does look bigger, but if you had them stand side by side, they would roughly be the same height. Now, the way Barricade would reattach that severed leg to his body would be the same way Starscream did with his arm, by reconfiguring the remaining parts on his leg so the new foot could be attached. And once that was done, Barricade, knowing that the battle wasn't in the Decepticons' favor, would transform and leave the city so he could fight another day. Now, you may be wondering how Barricade was able to transform since the foot he attached didn't have any Saline Mustang parts on it. And that's because since the foot was compatible with his body, once he transformed, it regenerated the missing parts. We know this regeneration is possible since Megatron was able to transform with his new arm, causing it to generate truck parts on it. And Optimus in Age of Extinction was able to generate new parts when he scanned his Western Star truck mode. So we know this is a thing Transformers can do. Now from here, this takes us to the events between Dark of the Moon and Age of Extinction. We know that soon after the Chicago War, Nesta was disbanded and Cemetery Wind was later put in place. We also know that many Transformers went into hiding. And since Barricade appears in The Last of Night, we know for a fact that he survived being hunted down. But now, let's move on to the events of Transformers Age of Extinction, which takes place in May 2018. We know the film takes place in 2018 since Antinger says that it's been five years since the invasion of Chicago. As this committee knows, the invasion of Chicago was a defining day for our nation five years ago. And we know it's the month of May since Tessa only has two weeks of high school left. Two more weeks, girls. No more classes ever. Now, as we know, Barricade did not appear in this movie. And there's a very simple explanation for that. That explanation being that he was still on the run from Cemetery Wind. And this can be backed up by a line Harold Antinger says. Fewer than a dozen Decepticons are still on the run. Thanks to our CIA unit, Cemetery Wind. So now this takes us to the events between Age of Extinction and The Last Night. We know during The Last Night, Barricade was under Megatron's command, so Megatron must have taken control of the remaining Decepticon forces on Earth before the events of TLK, with him likely making Barricade his second-in-command since he has been an OG member of the Decepticon since 2007. We also know that Barricade has been under government surveillance for a while, Decepticon Barricade was spotted at that same location. CIA's had him under Pred surveillance for a while now. But most notably, Barricade has a completely new body and vehicle mode, which would mean that he took on this new form before the events of The Last Night. Now, his new vehicle mode is a 2015 S550 Ford Mustang, which would mean at the earliest he took on this form while he was on the run from Cemetery Wind. And this would make sense since he would want to make himself look as different as possible to throw Cemetery Wind off. Hence why he's now blue instead of his classic black. Now, I don't believe his vehicle looked the way it did in The Last Night while he was in hiding, since a blue police car would stick out like a sore thumb. And his motto, Keep Calm and Hail Megatron, would be suicide to have on him since everybody knew who Megatron was by the time of Age of Extinction. Within that man-made prototype I fought, I sensed the presence of Megatron. But the Decepticon that started the Chicago War? I think he went into hiding just as a blue 2015 Mustang and laid low until Cemetery Wind was replaced by the TRF. 
I think once he regrouped with Megatron, he modified his vehicle mode to look more like a police car, along with giving it modifications such as the spoiler and the Keep Calm and Hail Megatron motto to make it look unique. This can be backed up since Transformers have the ability to customize their vehicle mode. A key example would be Optimus in Age of Extinction. Since after he scanned a white truck, he modified the schematics to make his own interpretation of it. So Barricade likely did the same thing, explaining why his vehicle mode doesn't look traditional. Now as for the reason why his body looks completely different, that's because Transformers can change any aspect of the way they look. A key example would be Optimus changing himself to look more like a knight. Though it's unknown why Barricade decided to do this, it could have possibly been done to symbolize a new age. As for why his body and face looks more humanoid, that's because Barricade has adapted and taken design cues from Earth. This can be backed up since Transformers who have typically spent longer amounts of time on Earth tend to look more humanoid. And I plan to cover this phenomenon deeper in a future video. Now a cool thing about Barricade in The Last Night is that his back eyes are now blue instead of red. Now the real world reason for this is that Bay thought it was cool. Michael wanted to go with dual eyes on Barricade. He's a police car type robot, and so we went with a blue and a red eye, and reconfigured his shape and his silhouette, and beefed him up a lot. But I like to think it's a callback to when he got his eyes sniped out. And we know that he regenerated his back eyes while he was in hiding, since Transformers can heal themselves over time, proven by this line in TF1. It's like a self-regenerating molecular armor. And with all that squared off, it's time to look at Barricade's final disappearance at the end of The Last Night, which takes place around the year 2020. Now, there are no concrete time references for 2020 being the year, but if you take into account that the TRF Supermaxes have already been built, along with Tessa still being in college, this would mean that the film takes place no later than 2022. Now, the last shot that we see of Barricade in The Last Night was when he and Nitro were fending off the TRF and the British military. And we know that Nitro left since we see him later with Megatron on Cybertron, leaving Barricade to fight off several tanks, TRF chopper gunners, and hundreds of army personnel alone. And I think we can all agree that Barricade would be no match for this much firepower, since in Dark of the Moon he was taken out by two sniper shots and a boomstick. And in several shots later of the night ship, we don't see the missiles flying overhead compared to what we saw earlier, which means one of two things. Barricade was either killed or he surrendered. And I have evidence for both scenarios, so it's up to your own headcanon to decide what happened to the bad cop. And sadly, we won't get an official answer since the Bayverse is now discontinued, with the Bumblebee movie and Rise of the Beast paving the rebooted universe. So with that said, Scenario 1, Barricade Gets Killed. The last line that Barricade says is this. I've lived for this. I've lived to kill a planet. And yes, his voice did sound different, but that's for another theory. But as it stands, Barricade claims that he lived to kill a planet. That planet, of course, being Unicron. And to fulfill that mission, he would do everything in his power to protect Stonehenge. So the energy transfer could be initiated, with him eventually going out guns blazing, serving the Decepticon cause to its fullest. Scenario 2, Barricade Surrenders. After seeing Nitro depart to help out Megatron, Barricade knew that he was outnumbered. Not wanting a repeat of what happened to him during Chicago, he stopped firing and raised his hands in defeat. From here, he would allow himself to be captured by the TRF so he could fight another day. And just like that, that was the fully explained Barricade Timeline Theory. I hope you guys enjoyed this video, and if you have not already, check out the Fixing Transformers playlist for some more awesome theories. But before I go, I want to say thank you to all my Patreons and channel members for supporting the channel. Thanks to you guys, Trans Theories is where it is today, so thank you. And as always, if you enjoyed the video, consider dropping a like rating because it does help the channel a lot. With that said, keep on theorizing.